desire to endure all the duties of the day. Then, as St. Paul promises, into my good years of life. This Mass has been offered for Ed Ross and Jenna Sacholi. second book of Kings. One day Elijah came to Shunem, where there was a woman of influence who urged him to dine with her. Afterward, whenever he passed by, he used to stop there to dine. So she said to her husband, I know that Elisha is a holy man of God. Since he visits us often, let us arrange a little room on the roof and furnish it for him with a bed, table, chair, and lamp so that when he comes to us, he can stay there. Sometime later, Elijah arrived and stayed in the room overnight. Later, Elijah asked, Can something be done for her? His servant Ehazi answered, Yes. She has no son, and her husband is getting on in years. Elijah said, Call her. When the woman had been called and stood at the door, Elijah promised, This time next year, you will be fondling a baby son. The word of the Lord. Our response is, Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord. 
The promises of the Lord I will sing forever. Through all generations, my mouth shall proclaim your faithfulness. For you have said, my kindness is established forever. In heaven, you have confirmed your faithfulness. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord. Blessed the people who know the joyful shout. In the light of your countenance, O Lord, they walk. At your name they rejoice all the day. And through your justice they are exalted. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord. You are the splendor of their strength. And by your favor your horn is exalted. For to the Lord belongs our shield. And to the Holy One of Israel, our King. Forever I will sing the goodness of the Lord. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, are you unaware that we who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were, we were indeed buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live in the newness of life. If then we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. We know that Christ, raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has power over him. As to his death, he died to sin once and for all. As to his life, he lives for God. Consequently, you too must think of yourselves as dead to sin and living for God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Because of her charity, because of her hospitality, 
that Alicia was able to prophesy that her prayers would be answered and that she who did not have a child would eventually be able to have one. In our gospel passage, we hear a similar type of story where Jesus is first addressing his apostles, pointing out to them exactly what it means to be a disciple of his. That it means to put our relationship with God above all else. That God has to be the most important relationship that we have in our lives. Not that other relationships are not important, but that we have to keep our faith always at the forefront of all of our decisions. And then he goes on to point out that when people receive them, whether they be apostles or righteous men, or even just a disciple, because of the fact that they recognize the holiness within them, that they will be taken care of. That God certainly sees, the God who can see everything does see every act of charity and every act of hospitality. As I was thinking this week and praying over these readings, I thought of a figure that's now, she's dead 40 years now, uh, Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day is a famous American Catholic. She was, if you remember back five years ago, I don't know about you, but it seems like three months ago is forever, you know, before all this started. It seems like there was nothing before this. But to think back five years ago when Pope Francis this September will be five years when he came and visited Philadelphia and other places in this country. And one of the things he did, he went to Washington and he addressed Congress. And in that addressing Congress, he talked about three prominent Americans as role models. He talked about Abraham Lincoln, he talked about Martin Luther King Jr., and he talked about Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day was born in the late 1800s. She was born in New York. She was one daughter, three sons, a rather secular family, but one that was uh, fairly well-to-do for the, for the time. In 1904, while she was still probably around eighth grade age, her father, who was a sports writer, got a job with a newspaper in San Francisco and moved the family out to San Francisco wasn't very good timing because we know that in 1906, San Francisco had the great earthquake. It was a devastating earthquake that among the things that broke during the quake were the water lines. And then when fires broke out after the earthquake, virtually what the city, the city that hadn't been destroyed by the earthquake was destroyed by the fire. And it was a devastating event in the history of San Francisco. One thing that a very young Dorothy Day realized that she saw the great charity and humanity of all the people of San Francisco, so many of them, just reaching out to strangers in need, that there was a catastrophe and people were just seeking to help one another. They didn't care who you were, they were just trying to get everybody safely through this. Her father, the newspaper folded, he lost his job, moved to Chicago. She became an educated young woman, uh, which was relatively unusual that day, and began to read just about everything. She was a very young girl, and she was one that was very idealistic. She became deeply cared for those who were less fortunate in the poor. She became an activist herself. She became a socialist. She was a woman suffragist. It's hard to believe it's a century since women gained the right to vote in this country. She had been arrested protesting outside the White House two years before it was legalized and was put in prison for 15 days. And there was a famous night within there where the protesters were actually beaten. And they were savagely beaten. She survived it, bruised and battered, but no less determined to continue to act to, to uh, be an activist and to try and work for justice and work for women's suffrage, women's right to vote. 
she began eventually, her, her parents uh, got all of their children into college, unusual in the early 1900s. When it came time for jobs, though, the parents helped the boys get jobs, but they didn't think that was, they needed a girl needed help with that. These were different times. She had a falling out with her family over that, and she became a rather radical socialist. She began to live a rather bohemian lifestyle. She is said to have smoked like a chimney. She drank way too much. She was involved in many romantic liaisons. She was hanging around socialists. She eventually began to write for a socialist newspaper. She eventually even interviewed and wrote uh, an interview with uh, Leon Trotsky, one of the founders of the Russian Revolution, the Communist Revolution. And she became quite a radical herself. Among her many relationships, she had one, she became pregnant. And her, the man she was having the relationship with said, I don't want to be a father, and if you don't abort that child, I'm leaving. And she did. She regretted that for the rest of her life. She later on took up with another man. Much to her shock, she became pregnant again. She thought she had actually become sterile the first abortion, and she was thrilled, and that man wanted nothing to do with this either. She was determined, and this time she stuck it out. She gave birth, she had a child, and then a woman who was really raised with no faith saw over and over again in her work for the poor, in her work for the suffering, she saw Catholics doing things, working for the poor. Even though she herself was not a Catholic, she went to the Catholic Church and she asked to have her child baptized. Took a little time for her to convince the priest that she was going to actually raise the child Catholic over the objections of the father. She had the child baptized and eventually she herself became baptized and became a Catholic herself. And then a few years later, she formed with a Frenchman by the name of Peter Moran, the Catholic Worker Movement. The Catholic Worker Movement set up houses of hospitality all over the country. The idea was to set up the medieval idea of monasteries, always welcoming in the visitor, always having hospitality for the poor, for the traveler, but to do it in an urban setting recognizing the people who are down and out, who had drinking problems, who had drug problems, who are homeless because of situations of abuse or something else, that they need a place to go. And eventually, she set up these houses and began the Catholic worker movement, trying to be Christ for others, not being judgmental, but just trying to help people she was still a bit of a socialist. She was certainly never someone who was silent. She basically alienated the right in the early part of her life. Um, she went after bishops. She said the bishops are our bishops. We are to listen to them. We are to, they are our spiritual leaders, but they're not our rulers. And if they're wrong, we should tell them wrong. But she would tell bishops, you're living too high. If you're living in a mansion, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be living a life of the poor. Of course, that didn't always go over well. <laughs> Eventually, as time went on and this movement kept going, and it still exists today, uh, especially with Vatican II, things started turning around, and then all of a sudden it was the liberals that didn't like her because she was, of course, an advocate for the poor, but she didn't agree with welfare. She thought welfare created dependency. And she said that people ought to take on the responsibility of charity themselves, individually, to step to the plate and not put it off on someone else to take care of them. She was avidly pro-life because she knew the harm 
of abortion, and she knew the results it had in her own life, as well as, of course, for her child. And then all of a sudden, it was the left that didn't like it. I think one of the keys, you know you've had a successful life, is when you've ticked off both the right and the left. You, know, you, you haven't pleased anybody, so hopefully you please God. I look at the, the figure of Dorothy Day. By the way, her cause is now open. She is a servant of God, so the petition, the movement has started to try and recognize her life and to have it hopefully one day canonized as a saint. It also shows you you can come from the worst of your sins, but God's always there to forgive and to turn around no matter what we've done. No matter how the thing that guided her once she found her faith, she had a great love of the, the liturgy, receiving Holy Communion, and also the scriptures, especially the Psalms. She was someone that was driven by a life of charity and a life of hospitality. She saw it first in socialism and even communism, but eventually recognized that it was incomplete without God. She was a radical pacifist. She loved and lectured the bishops that they should be petitioning for nuclear disarmament. She always, though, tread the line of saying that we have to stay faithful to the gospel, even if we don't like sometimes what the bishops and the priests are doing, but that we have to stay within the community in order to make the community more perfect. In many ways, I think she's an ideal saint for our time, because she speaks so much about the need to remain faithful to the gospel, to be men and women of hospitality, to care for the poor, and to take responsibility ourselves to provide for the poor, to maintain close to the sacraments, and to know and trust that no matter what we've done, we can turn away from sin, turn back to the gospel, and we know that we too can be forgiven and we can be saved. Let us stand now and together profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made and consubstantial of the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken to I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. Trusting in his generous compassion, we turn to the Father and voice our petitions. Our response is, Lord, help us live in newness of life. Lord, help us live in newness of life that God will strengthen the bond of unity between the faithful and the pastors of the church, we pray. Lord, help us live in the newness of life. For blessings on all health care workers, police, firefighters, emergency medical technicians, and all those who protect us at the risk of their own lives, we pray. Lord, help us live in the newness of life. That people everywhere will have an unfailing respect for all persons, from conception 
to their natural death. We pray. Lord, help us live in the newness of life. For those who suffer from sickness, addiction, and unemployment, that the Lord will comfort them and ease their suffering. And for those who have died, especially Robert Capone, and for Ed Ross and Jenna Sekowitz, for whom this Mass is being offered, that they may rise with Christ and enjoy eternal rest, we pray. Lord, help us live in the newness of life. For the grace of this week to take up our crosses, whatever they may be, trusting that Christ will safeguard us for eternal life, we pray. Lord, help us live in the newness of life. Loving Father, we praise you with all our hearts, for you have rescued us. Preserve us, protect us, change our mourning into dancing. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that this our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. And the Lord is a sacrifice of your hands, for the grace and glory of his name, for our good and the fall of his holy church. O God, who graciously accomplished the effects of your mysteries, grant, we pray, that the deeds by which we serve you may be worthy of these sacred gifts through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For when your children were scattered afar by sin, through the blood of your Son and the power of the Spirit, you gathered them again to yourself, that a people formed as one by the unity of the Trinity, made the body of Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit, might, to the praise of your manifold wisdom, be manifest as the church. And so, in the company of the choirs of angels, we praise you and with joy we proclaim. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fountain of all holy. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by setting down your spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. 
We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring it to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis, our Pope, Nelson, our Bishop, his assistant bishops, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, especially Eddie and Janet and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the blessed apostles, with all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and we praise and glorify you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may always be free from sin. And save from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, both not on our sins but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Lamb of God. social distance and for um, trying to keep as clean as we can be. We're asking one side of the right side of the church from my point of view, the less the other side. If you would come up first for communion, try and keep six feet apart. The arrows are there about six feet apart from each other. Once this side has completed receiving communion, then we ask this side. The reason is we don't want two lines. We're trying to keep as distant as we can.
Announcements after each mass or pews are disinfected. Um, if any adults can volunteer after mass tonight for a few minutes to help with the cleaning, it would be appreciated. We have these cleaning materials in the back. We have a couple of people, it won't take long to just wipe down the spots where everybody has been sitting to keep us as clean as we can be. Sunday bulletins are available at the doors. Please take one. Uh, as you know, there was no collection. That doesn't mean we don't need anything. Uh, there are baskets at all. Thank you for all your support for the parish during this pandemic. Let us pray. May this divine sacrifice we have offered and received fill us with life, O Lord, we pray, so that bound to you in lasting charity, we may bear fruit that lasts forever through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Mass is ended. Go in peace. Thank you.